good. What's happening, man? Just starting from New York, Toronto, and flying around. Talking Lincoln Lawyer, yeah. Things are good? Thanks for having me, man. Of course, man. Nice to see you. Uh, so you're not a lawyer. You play one in the films, though. Mm -hmm. But did you, you, didn't you want to be a lawyer at one point? Was that part of your path? That was, that's what I thought I was going to do in life. Um, always debated around the house. Then uh, I remember my dad one day saying I could, he was in the oil business and it all went under in 82. And right around that time he was like, I may need you to be a lawyer <laughs> to, <laughs> to take care of me. Anyway, I went to University of Texas, was headed towards, wanted to be a criminal defense lawyer. Mm -hmm. And then it was around my, the beginning of my junior year where I just wasn't sleeping well with the idea of graduate, go four more years, law degree, get out at 28, make an imprint, and you're already 30. Right. I didn't want to miss my 20s really trying to practice whatever it was I wanted to do. So I had a good friend at NYU Film School um, who was raving about his experience in the storytelling business, and I up and switched my, my, uh, my path and went to film school. You, you, know, you said d defense attorney. That's, yeah. a, that's a definitive choice because to be a defense attorney, a lot of people wrestle with the idea of who they have to work with. Yeah. Society needs good defense attorneys yeah. for sure. And in this particular film, you, you have to make decisions. You know, yes. you plea bargain. It's all, and it becomes a really ethical gray area of life. Yeah. What was it? Did that part of the storytelling speak to you? Found out it was much more gray than I thought it was. There's a, uh, there's a lot of, it's deal making. The more research I did with the, with the people that I hung out with from, not judges, but from different defense attorneys and DAs, they're all, they're all making deals. The prosecutor overcharges, the defense attorney comes in, you say 75, I say 25, we'll meet at 50, good, yeah, I win, let's move deal. on. But you know there's tons of wrongfully convicted people in prison yeah. as well, so it becomes an incredible, you know, so those deals, sometimes innocent people make those deals. Yeah just to get a decent sentence, one that they think they can live with, right? And that's a victory usually for the defense. We have that, that exact scenario in this film. Scariest, there's a line that goes through that uh, my character McCaller's father, who was, a, who was a lawyer, had left with them saying the scariest client you can have is one that's innocent. Mm -hmm. the scariest client you can defend is one that's innocent. And that scenario takes shape. It becomes a realistic, becomes real life for, for my character in this film. How do you live with that? How do you sleep if you have any moral conscience whatsoever? You know, knowing that you wrongfully put, not allowed, put somebody in jail because yeah. you didn't get them off. And it's so hard for the defense attorney to win anyway. The pros if it goes to trial, the prosecution's only going to take it to trial if they think they have a slam dunk. So the, the, the cards are against the defense winning anyway. Now, if you find that you've got an innocent client, then you don't sleep at night. You don't. Or just to plea bargain down and, and, and ameliorate that the, the, the sentence is not a real victory if you know they're innocent. You know, for, for, for people, you know, there's a certain generation of people, especially lately who grew up watching celebrity on television, they, they, they want to be something. You had a friend who said, I had a great time in, in, you know, in acting, and so you got into that. Is this business what you thought it would be? I, do, being an actor or even being an artist, and I had studied in school behind the camera, was not even in the vernacular of my dreams. I was raised nine to five, you go to work, you work, you work your way up a scale. That's from your old man, right? Yeah. yeah. And that was all I was able to even, like I said, dream about. Um, so the idea of, of living life and having a career that was in the arts, that was in the storytelling business, that was something that was really fun, was not something that, um, like I said, I even dreamed of. Um, I was in the right place, right time, right bar. Guy found me and said, "You want to come in and read for a part in a movie? Uh, I'm here producing called Days of Confused." I said, "Sure." <laughs> I go read for the part. It's got three lines. Three lines turns into three weeks' work. They're paying me 325 bucks a day. People are telling me I'm pretty good at it, and I think I'm getting away with something. <laughs> and I still do feel like I'm getting away with something. Well, didn't you yeah. ad lib the most iconic line from that movie anyway? I mean, Rick Linklater, the, the director and uh, and writer, wrote a couple of lines that I went, "Who is that guy?" You know, a guy, a young uh, senior walks by, and Wooderson, who's been out of school for five years, steps forward, looks at her backside, and says, that's what I love about those high school girls, man. I get older, but they say the same age. I mean, that line, I went, who is that dude, man? <laughs> and he's not advertising. He believes that. So that was sort of the, the launching pad when I said, 
if you have that coming out of a character's mouth, I want to spend more time with him. So I just kept showing up to, to, to the director saying, what about this? And What's interesting about your career is that you've been able to, I mean, that movie obviously set the tone for what was going to become quite a successful career, but everything I've learned about you is that the relationship between your dad was so important, and he passed away before you really had those moments. Five days into shooting that film, so the, days and confused. Do you think about that, the fact that he didn't get to see this? Well, I think about the serendipity of that it was five days into it, because before then, you're growing up, you know, you argue, Dad, I really need this skateboard. Dad, I really want these elbow pads. Is that really what you want to do? Yeah, Dad, I promise you, I really want it. Five months later, I haven't even worn out my elbow pads. It was a fad. Yeah. I didn't really stick with it, Dad, you know. Um, so that he was alive for the first thing that I stuck with and said, this is what I'm going to do. It's what I didn't know it was what I was going to do be doing full-time, didn't know if I'd be able to, but he was there five days into, he never showed up on set, but he was alive, and I talked to him a few times when I started doing the thing that has now become a career for me. You think about that sort of explosion of your career and all the big moves you had done, and you're at that stage now where you're not in your 20, you're not 22 years old anymore, so you're building that second wave of your life and second wave of your career yeah. in an industry that hasn't figured out what to do, but guys like you, you know, we knew what Redford and, and Warren Beatty were gonna turn into, and previously even a part of it, Brando, but your generation of guys, have you figured out what kind of Hollywood you want to be, what kind of yeah. movies you want to make, what kind of story you guys want to write as men as opposed to boys? It, it is a difference, because I'm, I'm a man now, not a boy. I don't, there, there are roles that just in the last few years, I'm just either not considered for or just shouldn't be considered for. Either that, you know, I'm like, no, that's, that was the other you know, no, I'm, I'm, I'm Mr. McConaughey now, yeah, whatever yeah. that is, you know what I'm I mean? I'm not Matthew uh, anymore, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know. Um, so, there's also, I've been doing it for 16 years, and things have worked out wonderfully well. I've had a great time. I've learned on the go. I've made decisions to, to track my own path. Some have worked out exactly how I thought they would. Others, it didn't turn out that way. Um, had any backfired on you? Nothing's really backfired. But I was sure as heck seen some films and I was like, that isn't what I thought we were making. <laughs> um, for sure. You know, I'm not gonna say any names. Um, and I've seen some that I, you know, after seeing them, went out in the parking lot and whew, was kind of sick to my stomach, you know? Um, and I don't even know if they were, they, were, they were bad. It was just the overall experience. It's a rush. You work on something for three months, you leave it for a year, you go see it, put into an hour and a half of celluloid, and a lot of memory comes back. A lot of your history comes rushing back to you. Um, you know, I'm, I'd say I'm a probably a, uh, there's sort of, in a way, there's less to things you want to prove. Also, I think 40's probably got something to do with it too. I'm not a real numerous, I'm like, hey, at 40, you gotta be doing this, but um, at 41, there's just, 30s, you figure out what you don't want. Process right. elimination, you get them out of the way. 40s, you start going, okay, I figured that out. I know where I don't want to be now, where I want to be. There's this moment, as you get older, you just draw a line and you call yourself on your own bullshit. Yeah. And it's much easier. Did Jim Morrison provide inspiration for the Dazed and Confused character? Is that true? Getting ready for that role, the first night, I went up for a, uh, a dress rehearsal and hair and makeup, and I stepped out of the trailer, and Rick uh, Linklater, the director, comes up and goes, this is great. Look like Wooderson, this is great. And he goes, Listen, man, I know you're not supposed to work tonight, but we got a scene at the top notch. It's Friday night. Um, you know, what do you, I think Wooderson might be there, you know, trolling for chicks or what have you, you know what I mean? And he goes, I go, yeah, he would be there. And he goes, what do you think, would Wooderson maybe be attracted to the redheaded intellectual? You know, because Wooderson's been around school, he's kind of been with all the typical beauties. What about the redheaded intellectual? You think he'd be into that? I was like, yeah. And I said, give me 30 minutes, let me take a walk. And he goes, okay, so I took a walk. Come back. I. We played verbal ping pong. I told him my ideas, and he told me his, and he goes, want to shoot it? I went, okay. <laughs> so boom, we go up to the set. I get in the car, and I'm like, I'm nervous. First scene ever on film, and right before we're about to shoot, I've got friends in the car. I'm going, I've been listening to this live, more live Doors album, and there's this, in, in between two of the songs, Morrison goes, all right, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> You ever heard that recording? Oh, of course. Right? The four. All right, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> so right before we're about to go, I'm like, what is Wooderson? What, what, what is Wooderson about? What's he about? And I go, man, he's about four things. He's about, you know, his car. He's about getting high. He's about rock and roll and picking up chicks. And I go, I'm in my car. I'm high as a kite. I'm listening to rock and roll. Action. 
and there's the chick. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> That's amazing. Three out of four. That's fantastic. <laughs> the, um, okay, so first of all, as a Texan, to... There's two movies that, you know, two famous movies that have either Dallas or Texan title. If you're not going to be in Debbie Does Dallas, you're going to be in a Texas Chainsaw Massacre series. And I am. You were. So as an actor from Texas, what's it like being in a Texas Chainsaw Massacre film? The classic. I mean, I've, I'd never even, I had seen the original that, that Toby Hooper did, but it was a, it was carny. Man, it was, we were shooting in 115 degree weather, myself, Renee Zellweger, about 16 hour days. And it was, uh, I'll say carny. It was a lot of fun. And uh, um, it was like anything goes. Yeah. It was anything goes. I actually have been offered the part of a role of a guy who shows up on a motorcycle at the beginning of the movie and at the end of the movie rides off with Renee Zellweger, sort of a Romeo to Juliet role. Yeah. That was never in the film. And when I went in to go, and I was all packed up to drive out to Hollywood because I just graduated college, right? I pull up to that audition to meet with the director with my truck and my U-Haul. I go inside, the director says, Kim Engel says, do you know, do you know anybody who'd be right for the Vilma role? This is the role that I played, the, the, the killer with the trucker and the record service and stuff. And I said, no, and I thought of two friends that I knew from, from acting class and I brought them up to him. And he goes, okay, I'll give him a call. I, I leave, shake his hand, go out. I remember I opened my truck door, started to step in and I went, I want to read for that. Shut the door. I went back in, and I said, do you mind if I read for the film report? And he goes, no. Uh, we looked around. There's a secretary behind the, the desk. And uh, he goes, all right. And we went in the kitchen, got a spoon. And he goes, scare the shit out of her. <laughs> <laughs> and so we threw furniture around, had her pin up against the wall, acted like the spoon was a knife, da-da-da-da-da-da. And he goes, now nah, act like your mechanical leg is all messed up and did all this stuff. Five minutes later, he goes, it's great. You want the part? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> Amazing. All right, last question. Yeah. Um, have you watched a movie and said, yeah, that movie's fine, but if I was in it, that movie would be amazing? Good question. Let me think. I don't know if I can think about this before time runs out, though. Um, <laughs> did you, like, watch the Bourne movies and go, Damon just doesn't have it? No, but I did watch him in Bagger Vance. Yeah. Doesn't have the golf swing for me to believe he's a scratch golfer. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have that swing? I got a better swing than him, that's you for sure. You could have been a bag of Okay, we'll talk about golf swings. <laughs> <laughs>